Hello dear friends, I welcome all of you who have shown the interest in learning this topic and are watching this video. I will make sure that you would learn the concept of preload and the preload responsiveness and its utility in the critical care practice. For an intensive care specialist, this topic may be easy to explain for many, but for the beginners, this could still be uh, confusion to differentiate the two, preload and the preload responsiveness. Classically, the preload has been defined as the maximum degree of myocardial fiber stretch or tension before the start of ventricular contraction and is determined by the mean sarcomere length at the end of diastole. The ventricular and diastolic volume is accepted by the consensus as the synonym of preload. The preload is one of the main determinants of the stroke volume and cardiac output. The other determinants of the stroke volume are the contractility of myocardial fibers and the afterload. This is the pressure volume loop of LV when the volume is reached to maximum point of myocardial stretch which is called end diastole and the volume contained in the ventricle at this point is called end diastolic volume. After this the ventricle starts contracting and building the pressure very fast and after a point it starts ejecting the volume called the stroke volume till the point where the systole ends. So the difference of end diastolic volume and end systolic volume is called the stroke volume and the EDV is called the preload here. This is the normal PV loop. When there is a deficiency in the preload, less tension is built up in the ventricle at the end of diastole resulting in the less stroke volume and this situation is commonly seen in hypovolumic conditions. Another scenario is described where you can increase the preload and you get the more stroke volume. Now question is, if we go on increasing the preload, will the stroke volume increase proportionately? What's your answer? Remember, there is a limit to everything. Myocardial fibers would not be able to respond to the tension developed. Hence, there will be blunting after a certain point and hence the relationship between the preload and stroke volume is not linear but is curvilinear called as FS curve or the Frank Sterling curve which has initial steep part and later flat part. The response to volume expansion can only occur in the state of preload dependence or preload responsiveness if the relationship is sufficiently steep. Now you know that not all preloading conditions would result in increase in the stroke volume. Therefore, left ventricle is considered to be preload unresponsive if it does not increase in stroke volume for a given preload. Classically, the preload responsiveness is defined as stroke volume increase of more than 10% in response to the IV fluid administration. Now, assess the situation. Here, if you increase the preload in this patient, what will happen? So definitely, as can be seen in this example, the patient is fluid responsive because stroke volume increases with the preload administration. But does that mean you still can give fluid? Is fluid responsive necess necessitating the uh, fluid administration? Now, this patient has pulmonary edema or ARDS type. Would you still be interested in fluid administration? There are two, uh, two answers. There are two answers. No, further fluid administration may aggravate the RDS. B, yes, provided this patient has signs of hyperperfusion. Now there is another situation. This patient has intra-abdominal hypertension with reduced urine output. Would you still be interested in fluid administration in this patient? Probably no because further fluid administration may aggravate the abdominal compartment syndrome or probably yes if this patient has the signs of hyperperfusion. So you have to look at the signs of hyperperfusion before administering the fluid and also you have to be mindful that you have to predict harmful effects of fluid administration that is the RDS and, and abdominal compartment syndrome. However, need of blood transfusion and oxygenation should also be assessed com continuously and simultaneously. Now let's examine another scenario. If 
you increase the preload in this patient, what will happen? Certainly, patient is fluid unresponsive and therefore there is no question of further volume loading in this patient. Even fluid administration may lead to lung edema and other signs of fluid overload. So, the fluid responsiveness testing is an important concept. The surviving sepsis campaign has adopted this concept and suggests that the fluid responsiveness is very important to guide the administration of fluid. Now, what if you do not want to test for fluid responsiveness and administer fluid while looking at the static marker, for example, central venous pressure? Then in that case, what will happen? Only half of the patient will be fluid responder, means that they will get benefit of the fluid, but half of the patient, there won't be any benefit. So remember, the central venous pressure and PAOP, that is pulmonary artery occlusion pressure, these two are most commonly used marker of right and left cardiac ventricular preload, respectively. It is now well admitted that both variables can not reliably predict the fluid responsiveness.